and say okay and then you're ready just share your screen and thank you okay well thank you Judith and Anish for inviting me and uh, sorry I got a little confused about the schedule I'll talk today about the work that uh, we have done at uh, with my colleagues at Neville Research Laboratory and it was uh, sponsored by ONR that uh, provided us the capability to run these really large simulation experiments. And I'll talk today about uh, ensemble forecast in the context of ocean mesoscale models. And this work is published in a paper led by Prasad Tapil. Okay, so what are ocean mesoscales? So this is a picture of uh, Kurashio current, and you can see this uh, swirls, it's very similar to Gulf Stream. I'm pretty sure that everybody in this room knows about ocean mesoscales, but to just summarize, there's these features in about 100 kilometers across, you know, scale about hundreds of kilometers, but they're essential for, um, they essentially dominate energetics of the ocean, modified mass, heat and freshwater transport, primary production, and gas exchange in the upper ocean. Joe Metzger looked at predictability of these features uh, in deterministic models, and he found that the predictability is about two weeks. So for example, on the right, he has this die-off curves for uh, anomaly correlation for Kurashio SSH, uh, or the same view using the SSH RMS. And you could see that uh, they reach 0.6 anomaly correlation about two weeks, or they reach the climatological RMS at about the same two weeks. However, some case studies suggest that sometimes eddy dynamics can be predicted out to order of 100 days. There is no systematic study of ocean middle scale predictability like we saw from Judith, Judith Falco earlier today. So we don't have a more theoretical upper limit like we have for mid latitude weather. So classical view of how we're gonna get better ocean forecasts is to just essentially write the Moore's law. And here we have this uh, uh, a graph from Boiler, Baylor Fox Camper that looks at uh, how IPCC model ocean resolution increases as the Moore's law increases. And there is a study by Chessonier and others. There are many very similar studies that shows that as you increase model resolution, you can better represent the climate of uh, western boundary uh, currents. Uh, to note, um, naval models were always about an order of magnitude uh, better resolved than um, IPCC models. And uh, getting into, um, you know, they've been uh, resolving mesoscale for about uh, two decades now. So with a this latest project on um, coupled forecasting that we had at the Navy called Navy ESPC, we had a unique um, ability to test the hypothesis that improved resolution and improved physics can lead to improved ocean mesoscale scale prediction. So we had two models that we developed, a deterministic short-term model, which was zero to 16 days at 19 kilometer atmosphere and about four and a half kilometer ocean in mid latitudes. And we had a probabilistic forecast, 0 to 45 days, 16 members, a little bit coarser atmosphere, and about 9 kilometer mid latitude resolution for the ocean. A deterministic model also had tides um, as part of the formulation. So these two model configurations allowed us to test the following experiments. Uh, hypothesis, does increased resolution help for ocean with a scale prediction? Does better physics help, such as coupling and tides? And do ensembles help? So a quick look here on the left, there's an original uh, uh, picture from Metzger and a very similar picture from our experiments. So one of the first things you would notice is that uh, our climatology got better. So if before the RMSC of climatology was about 14 centimeters, now it's an order of 11 centimeters. And this new climatology is computed, um, I think, using a dynamical model. So the second thing you would notice is that both high res and 
low res, you know, one twelfth is not considered by low res by most people, but uh, the one twelfth degree model has the same deterministic skill for uh, SSH anomaly. So doubling the resolution and including ties did not really improve a bulk measure like RMSE of mid latitude ocean weather. But doing ensemble predictions almost tripled the score. If you look at other metrics in mid latitudes, such as in situ SST, um, temperature from upper ocean temperature, from profiles, mixed layer depths, and surface heat flux, you can see that ensemble forecasting helps in every single case. Um, one thing you would notice is that the error bars on the subsurface uh, properties are, is much higher because we have fewer measurements. And you also notice the surface heat flux is very short, you know, we're talking about less than 10 days skill. And I think it's because surface heat flux is a, um, highly dependent on what the atmosphere is doing. And as we know, the atmospheric predictability is under two weeks. So this next set of questions to ask, why is ensemble mean forecast better? Is it because ensemble mean is smoother? And are we penalizing the high risk forecast by using RMSE scores? And a lot of this work has been already done in atmospheric weather forecasting, so it's not new, but all of this work was new to the ocean uh, domain. So that's the novelty of this work. And we're kind of riding in the wake of atmospheric research here. So the way we're gonna do it, we're gonna explore this along track SSH altimetry. So you can see the pictures of this SSH tracks on the top figure. And we're going to decompose it in a spectral domain. So we'll look along the track. So it's a 1D measurement. And we're going to decompose it. We can look at the power spectrum density of the altimeter measurement itself, which is a black curve here. Let me switch to a pointer. We can decompose uh, the uh, signal of the model. And we can decompose the error of the model minus alt altimeter minus model. But our skill metric will be the R square skill metric. So we'll take the ratio of power spectrum of error divided by the power spectrum of the signal. And the way you interpret it, if your R square is above one, it means that your errors are, are higher than your signal. So you have no, no skill, your errors are higher. And if your observation error is low, and the uh, um, variance of your model is comparable to the variance of the signal, that the maximum R square is two, which means that you have, you know, perfectly off phase in your observations and in your model. So if you're perfectly off phase, the R square is two. However, if your R square is less than one, it means you do have skill, your errors are smaller than the, your signal, and we determine it as a skillful model. An important note here is that altimeter does not provide useful information for under 150 kilometers. So if we average over multiple um, ensemble realizations, um, we can look at a one-day forecast as a proxy for initial condition, and a 10-day for, forecast, and we can see that um, in both deterministic models, they lack skill under 300 kilometers. So they kind of lack skill in this important mesoscale regime. But ensemble does. And the same uh, picture stands for 10 day forecast. So our suggestion is that this happens through this non-linear filtering of scales, of uncertain scales. So we can see that the deterministic, in a deterministic sense, initial condition is not constrained for scales under 300 kilometers. So look, let's look closely at this filtering of scales. So we'll look at it from two perspectives. So the most intuitive one, I can look at Kurashio and I can plot the, you know, the, the location of France between cold and warm waters. So 
in this case as, an, as a sage front. And you could see that if I plot individual forecasts in the ensemble, that the gray lines, there is a very high uncertainty in location of very small eddies. But the large fronts, you know, the large fronts are much better constrained. And what happens is that when you average over these multiple realizations of ensemble, you come up with some consensus of where the large fronts are located and where the potentially the small eddies are located. And that, that's what I mean by filtering of scales. Another way to look at it, you can initialize a, a low resolution deterministic forecast from ensemble mean. And as you do your forecast, initially you're tracking the error of ensemble mean, but after a while, because it's a deterministic forecast, your skill converges to that of a traditional deterministic forecast. And it's because you have a specific front realization that will always be erroneous you're losing the ability to filter scales through averaging. So now the criticism uh, was always like, well, you know, ensemble mean is smoother. So what if you just smooth a high resolution simulation? Will you get a more skillful result? So we did smooth our high resolution simulation. So here on the left, we're looking at R square again. And it indeed uh, smoothed uh, solution is uh, skillful, but there is a gap in skill between an ensemble mean and a Gaussian smoothing. And to demonstrate it, we can look at uh, these plots on the left where we have high rest resolution, high, re high rest simulation, low rest simulation, ensemble mean, smoothed high rest, and smoothed low rest. And there are a few things you will notice. First, once you smooth, you lose the variance of the single signal. That's one thing that happens. But you also lose a lot of information about um, the sharp gradients. You could see that ensemble mean preserves quite a bit more information about where these eddies are located. And we know it's a skillful information. While the smoothing just is, it's a, you know, it's a blunt tool. But the benefit is that you know when you smooth a high res simulation, it's a much cheaper computation, and uh, you keep, you know, you know, you inherit the low biases of um, high resolution model. My final slide. So not all ensembles are born the same. So here I'm looking at the spread of uh, eddy resolving ensemble versus the spread of one degree ensemble. And the spread of high uh, resolution ensemble is about 20 centimeters in the boundary currents. And a uh, eddy parameterized ensemble, the spread is about one centimeter. So it's about an order of magnitude less. If we run a quarter degree model, maybe we can compensate for the deficit by running stochastic physics, but that's an open question. So to summarize, First, increase in ocean model resolution beyond 112 degree. In addition, improved physics at least little scale to the deterministic ocean forecast. Eddy resolving ocean ensemble considerably increase the skill of the ocean middle scale forecast. And the superior skill of ensembles is achieved through nonlinear filtering of poorly constrained ocean mesoscales, which is similar to the results we had in the atmosphere. To really improve the ocean weather scale forecasts, um, we need more observations. So there are a couple of observation missions that are currently planned. One's called VACM, there's another one's called SWOT, that can really beat down on that initial condition uncertainty. And that's my, uh, my end of my talk, and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that was quite interesting. And uh, I'm not an ocean person, so it was new for me too. But what it reminded me of is um, when I worked on an ensemble system that was very, um, at the time, um, uh, lacking spread in the tropics, you could do anything, anything, any stochastic parameterization 
and the skill would go up. And the reason was that you had these unpredictable scales uh, that were represented in all ensemble members. And all you had to do is noise them up a little bit. And then the skill would go up dramatically because it was those, all these scales were the same, but they were um, but they were all uncertain. And so there was too much correlation in the unpredictable system. That's sort of what this talk reminded me of. Um, but um, but as the system improved, <laughs> it became much and much harder uh, to have the same effect in this case with stochastic commentizations because um, because the ensemble members had more diversity and so um, sort of a lot of the things you talked about sort of I interpreted sort of from that experience. Um, so thank you. Um, are there any questions? I think I'll add uh, before uh, I want to add on your comment, Judith. So the difference here is that the initial condition is unconstrained. I think that's the main problem. We don't have, because, you know, we can simulate those scales. I mean, this is 300 kilometers and our model has a four kilometer resolution. So we can definitely, you know, if we have a better initial condition, we can carry this France very well. So it's, it's a little bit different than tropics in yeah. the atmosphere. I, I appreciate that. Remark. Thanks so much, Anish. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Stuart, and thanks, Sergey. It was really interesting. And I guess my question is somewhat related to the initialization problem that you just mentioned. Um, so we have trouble observing these scales as well in the in the real ocean, right? Like with the satellite, you would observe the surface. We would SWOT and Wacom, we would get close to these scales, but with the subsurface, we don't have observations that would capture this unless you have like really high resolution gliders and like very specific regions. So in terms of like initializing both either global models or regional forecasting models, are there plans to observe these at subsurf in the subsurface? Or do you think like just observing the surface and then using some kind of SQG or other theories to extrapolate to what the subsurface meso and sub meso scales would look like um, to initialize them, would that suffice? Um, I mean, you could see if I go back. Uh... So on this slide, I'm showing the middle panels is a subsurface temperature. Yeah. Um, it's not as well constrained to the surface temperature. So adding more and like mixed layer depths, you yeah. know, is even worse constrained. Um, so if, if you're interested in the subsurface, I think you just have to have subsurface measurements. Right. <laughs> Would, so should that be just in the upper ocean, like the mixed layer and... Um... It depends on your application, right? I mean, if you're thinking about um, weather forecast, right? Yeah. SST is a key. And right. if anything, SST is all observed right now. Yeah. Um, like we have as many SST measurements per day as all atmospheric measurements gathered yeah. together. <laughs> um, but I mean, especially in the tropics, it's not just the SST, right? Like the mixed layer. Yeah, so in the tropics, you want to know what the, what the thermocline is doing, yeah. right? And you want yeah. to know um, the mix of the lab, the depths of the mixed layer, so you know how fast the ocean can respond to your atmospheric perturbations. And you have to observe it. I mean, there is no, I mean, yeah. you can't, you know, you don't know, this, the SSH can only tell you the displacement of the thermocline, but it cannot tell you where the thermocline is located. Yeah. And there is nothing on the surface. Well, there is a, there's a few measurements on the surface that can tell you um, infers the depth of the mixed layer, 
I think some optical measurements for for shallow mixed layers, but you know that's right. That's not going to help. Okay. I mean, right. yeah, and I mean the other question I had, if if I can do it, I don't see it. So, yes, um, so the other observations that currently we don't have at these scales is the surface fluxes, right? And SST is one component of it, but we don't observe the planetary boundary layer and its impact on the surface fluxes, which also is really key for the coupling problem at these scales, mesoscales. And especially in the mid latitudes, there's been uh, studies that show that the mesoscale air-sea interaction um, does matter for atmospheric weather evolution. So, yeah, would you have a comment on observing yes. the surface fluxes and assimilating them as well? So, especially in this uh, western boundary currents, you know, the ocean atmosphere is highly coupled. Yeah. And it is easier to observe uh, high resolution flux at a high repeat ratio than to observe SSH with the same resolution. And there are plans to do just that, you know, the butterfly and walk emissions that will allow you to observe fluxes over these areas. And I think the challenge for the data simulation community is to be able to in invert these fluxes into location of edges. And I think that that will dramatically improve our ability to constrain the initial condition for the ocean. Great, thanks. Thanks so much. Um, so um, next, we're going to go to Gathertown. Thank you so much for posting the link, Anish. And we can look at the posters and uh, just network in the different uh, areas, both private and public. And then uh, we will return uh, after uh, the networking and a break um, at uh, 11 AM. And uh, our next speaker will be um, Sam Stevenson. So I'll see you over in Gathertown, and then for sure um, we are at 11 for Sam's talk. Thank you. Thanks to all speakers today. It was great. <laughs>